So again, on purely statistical grounds, we shouldn't treat a fail to reject the null hypothesis decision as anything strong. And that comes down to the fact that we can never know ahead of time, or even after doing the study, what the probability is of making that type 2 error. And so that's the reason for our specificity here with how we talk about a fail to reject decision. We never accept or prove the null hypothesis on the basis of sample data. We simply never, ever talk about it that way. Remember this, as people go on in statistics and go on as researchers, we start to get lulled into this idea that we're making a strong claim when we fail to reject the null hypothesis, but we're absolutely not. A fail to reject decision is not good evidence that the null is true. We cannot think about the fail to reject decision in that way. So on purely statistical grounds, we should see why this is the case, why we never accept or prove the null hypothesis. But there's actually a more subtle and more pernicious epistemic problem that we have to deal with, and it comes down to the problem of induction. Now a little bit of history. This issue goes back to, like most things, the Greeks and Anesidemus, but more recently to two people I've told you about before, Sir Francis Bacon and David Hume. Now, these individuals talked a lot about epistemics, epistemology, and the strength of evidence based on what observations we've made. And they both talked about the problem of induction. So let me give you a statement, and let me have you evaluate whether it's reasonable. Say I've observed 10 swans, and none of those swans were black. Therefore, there are no black swans in the world. Now, first, that should sound ludicrous. And this is the problem of induction. I'm trying to make a statement about something I haven't observed. There's lots more swans in the world that I could observe, and I've only observed 10 of them. I can't conclude that there are no black swans simply because I've observed 10 white swans. Now that is a negative hypothesis. Me trying to prove there are no black swans isn't substantiated by me observing 10 white swans. Now consider another statement. I've observed 10 white swans, therefore there are white swans in the world. We're perfectly okay with that, that generalizes just fine. In the set of things I've observed, I found the thing I'm talking about. Therefore, it's perfectly fine epistemically for me to assert that there are white swans. But the other statement doesn't work. And that's the problem of induction. Now notice that in that context, when I'm talking about observing 10 white swans and there being no black swans, you probably felt immediately that it's problematic. But if I showed you the results of a study, I've observed 10 people and observed no effect of my treatment, therefore there is no treatment effect, that almost seems okay because it's couched in a statistical language, but it's the exact same problem of induction. Whenever you hear somebody say they failed to reject the null, therefore the null is true, it is just as ludicrous as saying I've observed 10 white swans, therefore there are no black swans. That is just as problematic of a statement epistemically. So notice that affirming a positive hypothesis is relatively easy. Me saying there is an effect because I've observed an effect, statistical issues aside, is just fine. That's just like saying I've observed a white swan, therefore there are white swans. However, proving a negative hypothesis requires an entirely different class of evidence. For me to say there are no black swans in the world to prove that negative hypothesis, I need to observe every swan every single one everywhere in the world, and I need to make sure there isn't even one black swan, because even one black swan would falsify that negative hypothesis. That is, I need to see every member of a class in order for me to say that nothing is there. So remember, if you ever hear somebody say they've proven the null hypothesis on the basis of sample data, that is like saying they've proved there are no black swans when they've only observed white swans. So, a way to think about this is a lack of evidence for an effect in a sample is not good evidence for the lack of an effect in the population. And a more pithy way of saying this is absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. And this is attributed to Altman and Bland. Bland is perhaps the worst publication name you can have, but the statement is perfectly good. So, absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. Now, this can be seen both on statistical grounds. We couldn't possibly know what the probability is of beta before doing a study. And also on epistemic grounds, we simply cannot say there are no black swans by observing 10 white swans.